Dr. Nicholas Christakis directs the Human Nature Lab and is the co-director of the Institute for Network Science. He is a social scientist and physician who conducts research on social factors that affect health, health care, and longevity. His current research focuses on health and social networks, and especially with how ill health, disability, health behavior, health care, and death in one person can influence the same phenomena in others in a person's social network. This work involves the application of network science and mathematical models to understand the dynamics of it all. Please welcome Dr. Nicholas Christakis with Why Humans Have Friends. So, uh, thank, uh, so thank you very much for that introduction. So what I'm going to be speaking about today in the 20 minutes or so that I have is real human social networks and not so much the online variety, but rather the kind we humans have been making and embedding ourselves in for tens of thousands of years. And the structure and function of human social networks are, we think, deeply rooted in our biology and in our evolutionary past. And I also want to make a few remarks about what we might do with this knowledge. So what if we understand the structure and function of human social networks? What's the point of a basic science program that seeks to understand how and why we assemble ourselves into these networks? What can we do with this knowledge to make a world a better place? I'm going to be telling you about a couple of experiments that we've been doing in our group to explore how we might intervene in human social networks in order to make the world better, improving public health, fostering cooperation, and increasing other desirable properties of human populations. So, um, so, here is what, so here is what a real social network uh, looks like. Every dot is a person. Every line connecting them is a relationship between the two people. And each of us chooses our friends and our coworkers and, inherit, and our spouses and inherits our relatives. And each of those people to whom we are in turn connected also has other such individuals. And in the process of each of us exercising these choices, we assemble ourselves into this incredibly ornate structure. And we proceed to live out our lives embedded in this structure. And to me, social networks are intricate things of beauty. And they are so elaborate and so complex and so ubiquitous, in fact, that one has to wonder, what purpose do they serve? I mean, why do we do this, we humans? This is the equivalent of ant colonies. We <laughs> assemble these elaborate structures. We live our lives within these structures. And they have this particular kind of appearance, as I'm going to show you. So the questions become, how do networks form? How do they work? And how do they affect us? And I spent the last 10 years or so researching how and why human beings form social networks and how they affect our lives, how they affect our health, our desires, our feelings, our thoughts, and our actions. And I'm going to briefly start with the work that we have did with obesity, because it sets the stage for illustrating a number of other uh, points. So now, as most of you probably know, the prevalence of obesity has been increasing dramatically over the last uh, 10 years in our society, going from about 20% of Americans being obese to 30% of Americans being obese. And it's common to speak about obesity as being epidemic. And it's clear that obesity is epidemic in one meaning of the word, which is that there's more of it than there used to be before. But we wondered whether we could find evid evidence for obesity being epidemic in another meaning of the word, meaning that it's some kind of contagion between individuals. Could we find evidence for a spreading process of weight gain within human populations? And to the extent that obesity is a product of personal choices and voluntary behaviors, and the fact, given the fact that people are embedded in these social networks and are influenced by the behaviors of others around them, we thought it should be possible to find evidence for obesity epidemics. And this image, taken from one of our first studies, helped us to understand the role of social networks in obesity. Every dot is a person. Every line between them represents a relationship between two people. And we make the dot size proportional to people's body mass index. So bigger dots are bigger people. And in addition, we color the dots yellow if they're properly obese. And if you look at this image, you might be able to see clusters of yellow and red dots within the system, as if there were little outbreaks of obesity, little sort of epidemics, mini epidemics within this, this uh, social network. Um, but still, the complexity is very high, visually speaking. And in any case, several questions are raised by this clustering, such as how much clustering is there? Is there more clustering than due to chance? How big are the clusters? And most interestingly, what might cause the clusters? So we borrowed some ideas from statistical physics, and we analyzed the data in the following fashion. 
On the y-axis is the increase in the probability that a person is obese, given that a social contact of theirs is obese. And on the x-axis is the degrees of separation between the two people. And what this says on the far left purple bar, that if your friends are obese, you've got a 45% higher likelihood of being obese yourself. And in the red bar, if your friend's friends are obese, you've got a 25% higher likelihood of being obese. And in the orange bar, if you're at three degrees of separation, if your friend's friend's friends are obese, you've got a 10% higher likelihood of being obese. And it's only when I get to your friends, 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 friends at four degrees of separation that there's no longer a relationship between that person's body size and your body size. So this kind of mathematical analysis confirms a couple of things. First, there's more clustering than due to chance. If there were chance uh, assortment of obese and non-obese individuals within the social network, the, the lines here would be 0% across the board. And second, that the radius of the clusters is to three degrees of separation. So if I knew nothing else about you than the body size of this person who's almost certainly a stranger to you, your friend's friend's friend, for example, I would be better than chance able to predict your body size. But this analysis doesn't tell us what might be the cause of these clusters. And there are at least three possibilities. One possibility is a kind of social domino effect. I gain weight, it makes Tom gain weight, Tom gain weight, it gets Sandy gain weight, and there's a kind of spreading process through the network, uh, a kind of induction effect. A second possibility is homophily or love of like, or birds of a feather flock together. Maybe it's not that my weight gain causes Tom's weight gain. Maybe he and I form a relationship because we have a similar body size to begin with. And a third possibility is that it's neither that my weight is causing his weight, nor that we form a relationship because we have a similar body size, but rather that there is something in the context, maybe a nearby gym that makes us both lose weight, or a nearby fast food joint that makes us both gain weight at the same time. All three of these processes are typically present in any social phenomenon. And the challenge is to use correct econometric methods to disarticulate the statistical methods to see evidence for each of those three, or to do experiments, as I'll show you in a moment. Um, and so, and these typically occur in anything. Are your kids doing drugs because their friends are doing drugs? Or are they already drug doing kids that are choosing other drug doing kids? Or is there a local pusher that's pushing drugs on all the kids? These types of ideas can be examined with all kinds of phenomena. And so we did a variety of observational and experimental approaches uh, to sort this out. And we found evidence for induction in the social networks. We found evidence for spread of obesity, a kind of social contagion within the system. And in the process, we also documented homophily uh, and the role of context in a variety of ways. Now, we also became interested in other sorts of phenomena. For example, we became interested in human emotions. When human beings have emotions like anger or happiness or fear or disgust, we show them. Why? Why do we do that? It's not hard to construct an argument from evolutionary biology as to why we would experience emotions, why it would increase our fitness to be able to experience these things. But not only do I experience these things, but I show them. And not only do I show them, but you can read them. And not only do you read them, but you copy them. It would seem that emotional contagion is a very deep and fundamental aspect of human emotional experience. And in fact, this function of emotions suggests that whatever other advantages they offer, emotions are also a primitive form of communication. Now, we're accustomed to thinking about emotional contagion as fleeting and involving a pair of people. For example, a few years ago, I talked about this work in New York City. And I said, you know when you're on the subway and the person across the car from you smiles at you and you instinctively smile back? And they said, we don't do that in New York City. <laughs> and I said, well, everywhere else in the world, that's normal human behavior. And in fact, Jane Goodall, when she, looks at, when she studied chimpanzees, she saw that chimps, when one shows a play face, which is the precursor of our smiling, another chimp will show the play face. There's something very primitive and ancient about emotional contagion. And we also realize that emotional contagion can be broader still, for example, in the punctuated and broad expressions of anger. But we wondered whether emotions might spread beyond pairs of people, and might they do so in a more sustained way than riots. Could there be a kind of a quiet riot? Could there be a kind of below the surface emotional stampede? Could we borrow the mathematics that's used to study this type of flocking behavior in birds and in fishes and use it and apply it to humans and see whether humans synchronously move when it comes to emotions or other behaviors? And could we find evidence that emotions spread across network ties well beyond pairs and in a more sustained fashion all the time? Maybe, in fact, emotions have a collective existence and not just an individual existence. And so we made one of the first network maps, of, I think the first network map of human emotions with NIA support. Uh, every dot is a person. Lines represent relationships. The blue dots are sad people, and the yellow dots are happy people, and the green dots are in between. 
And if you look at this image, you can once again see clusters of sad and happy people within the social fabric. It too goes to three degrees of separation. And similar analyses to those that we did for obesity suggest that there's a role of induction, emotional contagion, and also of homophily and contextual effects. You might also note that there's a structural thing because the blue dots are more likely to be on the edges of the network. They're more likely to be structurally on the periphery of the social fabric. Now to get around some of the problems with drawing conclusions from observational data and to dig deeper into the evolutionary significance of networks, we've also begun to do experiments. So uh, one of the experiments we did is, is we brought people into the laboratory we gave, with strangers. We randomly assigned them to groups of four, and we gave them a little bit of money. And we said, if you're kind and give the money to the, your colleagues, these other strangers, we will multiply that money, and everyone will be better off, even though you've paid a price. So the logical thing uh, for any individual to do is to defect, not to be kind, hope everyone else is kind, and they'll benefit. But of course, if everyone does that, the whole group suffers. So it's a trade-off between individual benefit and collective benefit. And then we would ring the bell, and we would randomly assign them new strangers, and then ring a bell and randomly assign them new strangers. And we did this for multiple rounds. And what we found was that if Eleni is kind to Lucas in period one, Lucas goes on to be kind in, to Erica in period two, and Erica goes on to be kind to Jay in period three, and Jay goes on to be kind to Brecken in period four. This shows a spread, a kind of pay it forward of altruism and kindness. This is not, if I'm kind to you, do you reciprocate the kindness? This is, if I'm kind to you, do you are you then kind to her, and is she then kind to her? And one, this, this result was one of the most bizarre results out of my lab in the last five years, because what I've just shown you is that whether Jay treats Brecken kindly depends on how Eleni treats Lucas, even though neither Jay nor Brecken ever saw Eleni or Lucas. How I treat you depends on how she treats her, even though we don't know those two people because the effects spread through the system like a kind of social contagion. So pay it forward is real. And in fact, when all the ripples are added together, it's clear that the network functions as a kind of matching grant, doubling the return on the first person's initial contribution to the public good. And hence, using both observational and experimental methods, we and others have provided evidence that a variety of behaviors and phenomena spread within networks via social contagion. We've looked at obesity, smoking, drinking, and drug use, emotional states, happiness, loneliness, depression. I showed you some altruism, sleep, exercise, purchasing behavior, and ideas. And the network structure, the actual mathematical structure of these networks, is highly relevant to other sorts of phenomena, such as the spread of germs and the spread of information. Understanding the pattern of human interactions gives us new techniques to intervene in epidemics, to stop them cold, or to forecast them in ways that, alas, I don't have time to discuss today. Networks also facilitate a kind of learning, social learning, that involves learning from others rather than from one's own experience. And in fact, one of the key ideas that we've been converging on is that networks magnify whatever they are seated with. One of the reasons we have friends is to create a social magnifying glass. This social magnifying glass magnifies anything it is seated with. It will magnify fascism. It will magnify Ebola. It will magnify violence. It will also magnify altruism and happiness and information. It is agnostic. It will magnify anything, but it must be seeded. You must put something into it, but then we humans, by assembling ourselves into these networks, take over or kick it off and make it much bigger. Now, this work with emotions and with cooperation, which are so fundamental, um, has got, and coupled with the idea that networks may have a function, got us to thinking about the evolutionary basis of networks themselves. And human social networks always look strikingly similar. They always look like the images that I've been showing you so far. But they never look like this. They never look like a regular lattice. Why not? I mean, why didn't we evolve to be an animal that makes networks that naturally look like this? Well, the striking patterns of human social networks, their ubiquity and their apparent purpose, beg the question of whether we evolved to have them and to particular kind of networks in the first place. So humans are very unusual as a species in that we form stable, long-term, non-reproductive unions to other members of our species. Namely, we have friends. Why? Why do we have friends? It's not hard to construct an argument from evolutionary biology as to why we would have sex with other people. It's rather more difficult to explain why we befriend other people. And yet we and very few other species engage in this very unusual behavior. So to understand this, we need to dissect network structure a little bit first. 
First of all, notice that in this type of a network, every position is the same as every other position. Everyone has eight friends, and every one of their friends has eight friends. And if I took this surface and wrapped it around a sphere, or more properly a donut, every position would be equally central and peripheral in the network. But of course, that's not what natural networks look like. Natural networks have this kind of a structure. And I want to very briefly introduce three concepts from network science, and then make a couple of points about evolutionary biology, and talk briefly about introductions, and I think I will be able to finish on time. So, uh, so look at node B. B has, if I keep speaking at this velocity. Uh, so node, uh, node B has four friends, and node D has six friends. Okay, B on the upper left and D on the far right. This is known as the degree of a node. And people know this about themselves. You know you have five friends. You know you have four friends. I have no friends. People know how many friends they have. Now look at nodes C and D, C in the middle, D on the right. They both have six friends. And this might be the limit of their understanding of where they are in the network. But we, with this bird's eye view, can see that C and D are very different. And I can cultivate this intuition in you by asking you, who would you rather be if a deadly germ was spreading through the network, C or D? Uh, D, you want to be on the edge. You want to be so that you're not going to get whatever's spreading. Now, who would you rather be if a juicy piece of gossip were spreading through the network? <laughs> C, right? That's known as the centrality of a node. Now nodes A and B both have four friends. Uh, the difference between them, however, is that A's friends are friends with each other, and B's friends are not. So in A's friend, this is known as transitivity. My friend's friend is my friend in A. My friend's friend is not my friend in B. And all three of these traits, it turns out, are heritable. So in some other work we published also with NIA support, on the far right, the percent of variance explained or the heritability is shown. And 46% of the variation in how many friends people have can be explained by their genes. Now, that's not a shocker. Some of us are born shy. Some of us are born gregarious. That people vary in their taste for friendship is not big news. But we also find that 47% of the variation in people's transitivity can also be explained by your genes. This is another very bizarre result out of my lab the last few years. What I've just told you is that if you have Tom, Dick, and Harry in a room, whether Dick is friends with Harry depends not just on Dick's genes or on Harry's genes, but on Tom's genes. Whether Dick is friends with Harry depends on the genes of some other person. How can that be? We think the reason is that people vary in their tendency to introduce their friends to each other. Some knit the networks around them together, and some do not. And even centrality is also partially heritable. So where you are in this vast fabric of humanity depends in part on your genes. And the fundamental reality of our desire for particular kinds of connection has always been with us. Now, if social network structure has biological and genetic antecedents and evolutionary significance, it begs the question of how ancient this structure is and whether we can document it in non-modernized settings. So what we would love to do is fly 10,000 years back to the Pleistocene and map those networks, and the claim should be they should be the same as ours. Now, we can't do that, but the next best thing we could do was to go and study the Hadza, who are one of the last remaining hunter-gatherer populations on the planet. They live like we did 10,000 years ago. They have no material possessions to speak of. They sleep out under the stars. Uh, they don't have agriculture, and so forth. And so we uh, studied 17 Hadza camps around Lake Ayasi in Tanzania. We took, made a Hadza Facebook. Uh, we made a photographic census of all the adult Hadza. There are only 1,000 of them left. Only 500 of them uh, live in the traditional way. We took this Hadza Facebook into the field. We asked the Hadza to identify their friends in a variety of ways. And to make the long story short, Hadza social networks look just like ours, <laughs> visually and mathematically, in everything we could throw at them, despite the fact that in the intervening 10,000 years we've invented agriculture and cities and telecommunications, we make the same networks that they do. So network structure has an ancient origin, and it doesn't seem to have changed. And we've begun to think about, and then I'm going to present these two experiments, and then I'll stop. We've begun to think about how to exploit these observed properties of networks and other fundamental observations about network structure in order to intervene in social systems to maximize behavior change by exploiting a mathematical understanding of human interactions and of the rules undergirding social contagion. And we have two kinds of ideas. One is that we can manipulate connections between people, uh, changing the structure of the network. Or we can manipulate contagion and change the flows, manipulate how things flow through the system. And there's expanding science in both areas. One experiment, uh, and I'm just going to show you uh, experiments with respect to social contagion. Here's a recent experiment of ours uh, manipulating contagion. We uh, decided we were going to map networks in developing world villages. Imagine the village on the left and the village of the right. Every dot is a person, and the lines represent social relationships. 
in the village on the right, we're going to pick six people at random, and we're going to give them an intervention, like a clean water intervention, or a vaccine intervention, or an anti-malarial bed net intervention. Uh, and in the village on the left, in the control village, we're going to give no one an intervention. Now, the conventional way of thinking about interventions of public health is to come back and look at the people you treated and see whether they responded. I'm not interested in the people that I treated. I'm interested in the people I didn't treat. How did the intervention spread by contagion from the treated to the untreated in the treatment village on the right compared to the control village on the left? So maybe three of the six people responded on the right, and they recruited three of their friends. So six of them responded overall. And on the left, in the control village, maybe two people responded after all. What if instead, however, of picking people at random, I pick six central people, or use some other mathematical insights to pick who's influential, who's in a structural position of power in the network? Same villages, same intervention, same number of people targeted, much bigger effect potentially. Now, maybe three of the six respond, but they recruit 30 of their friends. So I get 33 respondents for the same amount of uh, money spent and the same kind of intervention. And we can experiment with different algorithms, different ways of picking these individuals. So we've begun to do this in different locations around the world. I'm going to show you one uh, study that we're doing in the highland villages of Honduras. This is what the area looks like. We mapped the social networks of 32 villages spread out in space in this region. We randomly assigned the villages to different targeting algorithms. A third of the villages, the people were 5% of the people were picked at random. A third, 5% of the most central people were picked. And a third, 5% were picked by the Christakis Lab secret sauce. Uh, in a very special way. And, um, and uh, the question is, could we move the whole village? Can we make the whole village do what we want? The same ideas can be applied in classrooms in the inner city, in nursing homes, in hospitals to get doctors in, to prescribe or change their behavior. Very same ideas can be applied broadly. And what we found was that we could do that. On the y-axis is the mean proportion of expressing this. Uh, this is a multivitamin intervention. And on the x-axis is time. And what we found is at the beginning, 5% of the people had the intervention. By the end, nearly 80% did. Uh, and it was the best when we used the strategy uh, in the purple strategy. And we have many other similar results. So I'm going to stop with these two slides. Think about these two objects. They are both made of carbon. And as we all learned in high school chemistry, the difference between these two objects is how the carbon atoms are connected. Take the carbon atoms and connect them one way, you get graphite, which is soft and dark. Connect them another way, you get diamond, which is hard and clear. And there are two key intellectual ideas here. First, these properties of softness and darkness and hardness and clearness aren't properties of the carbon atoms. They are properties of the collection of carbon atoms. Second, which properties you get depends on how you connect the carbon atoms to each other. Connect them one way, you get one set of properties. Connect them a different way, you get a different set of properties. Similarly, the pattern of our connections among human beings affects the properties of social groups. It is the ties between people that make the whole greater than the sum of its parts. And new properties, maybe even cooperation or infection resistance or intelligence, may emerge because of the connections, because of the ties between people, and not necessarily because of the people themselves. In fact, our experience of the world depends on the actual structure of the ties around us near and far. Thank you very much.